The first thing that I want to say for steps of success for splinting, PMS, pulse, motor, sensation. We want to go ahead and check for distal PMS. Distal means away from that, right? So if it's on a forearm, humerus, something of that sort, we're going to go ahead and check a radial pulse. Make sure that you have good cap refill on the fingers, that the patient's able to move it. And whenever we splint, first thing that we do after checking PMS is we need to hold manual stabilization. Do not forget that. Manual stabilization. This is something that not only you'll see in written exams, but you'll also see this in, let's say you do your cycle motor exam. And on your cycle motor exam, you're gonna have to do some sort of trauma scenario. In that trauma scenario, you will most likely have to splint and you will have a partner with you on that cycle motor exam have that person hold manual stabilization after you check EMS while you get the splint ready to wrap on that patient. So over here on that side, we have a compound fracture. A compound fracture just means open, okay? It means that the bones have actually protruded through the skin. We splint that like any other fracture. The only thing that we do differently for compound fractures is we make sure that the bleeding is controlled. That's it. Loose wrapping. Um, because we're well, the whole goal is to not push the bone back into the actual skin itself. We want to just loosely wrap over that, making sure that it's not bleeding, and then we're still going to splint it to a rigid board. Now, with regards to what size rigid board are you going to pick? Remember, whenever we're splinting a wound or a fracture, we need to splint the joint above and the joint below every time. So if it's a tib fib, we need to splint the ankle, we need to splint the knee. So there's two joints that are covered, the patient's completely immobilized and they can't move that extremity. That's the whole point on splinting. We ain't done with splinting just yet. This is a new paramedic or EMT, new EMT's worst nightmare, the traction splint. Traction splint is used for closed mid-shaft femur fractures. Now, it has to be just that. Literally can't be anything else. If the patient has a dislocated patella, eh, contraindication. If the patient has a, a possible broken ankle, eh, contraindication. If the patient has a possible hip fracture, contraindication. So with that being said, we have to know that this is a closed femur fracture. Sometimes easier said than done, okay? Now, you might say, well, Mike, how, how are we going to know if it's a mid-shaft closed femur fracture by just visualizing, okay? I'm going to tell you firsthand that these people, their thighs are, they get massive, all right? And why, why is their thigh massive? Because their body's basically trying to self-splint that femur. Now, to self-splint that femur, your body's got to send a lot of fluid, to your thigh area and it starts to create a, basically a compartment and pushes down on their thigh, but to do so their thigh really swells up. So they basically splint themselves when they break a femur or bone that large. We gotta think, man, femur is such a, not only a powerful bone, but it's so, it has so much vascularity. There's so much blood that actually goes to the femur and you can lose up to 1500 mls of blood through just one femur fracture which is pretty crazy with that being said let's say that the thigh is massive right you see a possible outward rotation kind of like i know this on this photo right above me this is the leg that's broken but on the other side if that foot was like literally falled off to the side kind of like in a hip fracture sometimes the patients with femur fractures their foot will be flopped over one way or the other because obviously they don't have really control of it you have to be able to look at that leg and say, is this, does there hip involvement or not? Okay. And you might ask, well, how am I going to know if hips involved? Well, we can try a test and that test will include what we call manual traction. Manual traction means I'm going to grab that person's ankle and lower leg, and I'm going to gently pull traction. Now, remember, these patients are in pain. Basically, what's happening is their femur itself is broken, and one part of that femur is literally pushing up into that patient's thigh or into their muscle, and it's causing a lot of pain and discomfort. Once I start pulling that manual traction and I allow those bones to line up, 
I should be relieving pain. If this patient has a hip fracture, any hip involvement, when I start pulling, it's going to also start pulling on the hip, right? And that's going to cause a lot of pain. So whenever we're pulling manual traction, we're assessing our patient to ensure that we're not making things worse. If the pain starts to get worse than normal, stop. It's the whole point, right? So we check PMS first. Cool. Manual traction. Remember I said with regular splinting, we manually stabilize. This one's not only manually stabilizing, but we're actually pulling it into position. Then we're going to go ahead and assess for PMS. Now, if you are by yourself and you're the one holding the manual attraction, guess what? You're stuck. You can't go anywhere. You're going to hold that manual traction while somebody else gets a traction splint, which we have two options. Okay. This one right above me right now is called a hair splint. So the hair has two rails, goes right underneath the patient's leg, and typically has like one of these kickstands where you can actually prop their legs up. It has a lever on the on the backside towards the feet where you actually have to measure it on the patient's good leg first. How far do we measure it? Six to 12 inches from the patient's foot. Then we said we can put on the ankle strap and start cranking it up. Right, we crank, 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 and the whole purpose is not only to to maintain that traction, but to relieve pain. Okay, we're trying to get that bone fragment out of the patient's thigh and back into position to reduce pain and discomfort. That's the whole goal. It's the whole reason why we're doing traction. All right, on the other side, we have a Sager splint. What's cool about the Sager splint, and I and I chose this photo for a reason, is you with one Sager splint you can pull traction on both legs, which is pretty cool, right? You can't do that with a hair. You would need two hair splints to pull bilateral fractures. Now, with the Sager splint, you just got to remember, it's going to be up in the patient's crotch or groin area. And when you pull traction, it's going to, it has to push up against their crotch. So it can be a little uncomfortable, um, but sometimes that's the least of those patients' worries, right? They have this femur fracture, they're in a lot of pain. Uh, we're going to go ahead and assist with that. Remember, once the traction is pulled, we have it in place where we want it. We then strap it up. Okay, on both of these, you can see the straps that are, are that are on these patients. With straps, just make sure you don't put them on joints. Okay, on this hair right above me, we have one strap that's on the ankle. They have one right below the patella one right above the patella, and then one on the thigh. That's fine. That's good placement. We never want to place straps on any of the joints. You also don't want straps super tight because you don't want to try to like reduce their blood flow. So just make sure we have good PMS before and obviously after. Now, there's one thing that I did not mention that I meant to talk about in this slide, still talking about splinting, is do we leave it in place? And what I mean by leave it in place, what if you have an angulated fracture? Let's say you show up on a car accident, uh, maybe vehicle versus pedestrian, you walk out and this person's leg is literally like a 90 degree sticking out the wrong way. That leg should not be positioned like that. You're looking at it, you're like, man, this thing's disgusting. How do we splint that? And do we just leave it in place and start wrapping it? Answer is no, we don't, all right? The, the, the whole goal is to get that leg to be in the position of function. If a leg is massively angulated, we'll pull gentle. Most of the times we'll be pre-medicating these patients, trying to give them some sort of analgesics to reduce the pain. Nice and easy. If the patient starts yelling or you meet any sort of resistance during this, we'll stop, okay? but we want to get it in line like a normal leg should be, then we'll hold manual stabilization and wrap. So don't think just because something is grossly angulated that you need to splint it in place and then try to get them onto a backboard or try to get them back into your truck because their leg's going to be hanging off the stretcher and somebody's going to have to be holding onto it the entire time. I'm telling you, it's going to be so much easier for you. Just move it back to where it should be splint then just make sure you have good PMS before and after. Okay. Cannot stress that enough, but yes, we do put 
especially extremities back into the position of function.